Hi everyone, it's Don and I hope you're having a fantastic week. Well, today I want to talk to you a little bit about the Queen Mary 2 and I thought I'd give you my top 10 things that you really, really should know before heading off on the Queen Mary 2, especially if you're doing a transatlantic crossing. Number one thing you should know is that the Queen Mary 2 is a small, large ship. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's a couple definitions. And one is, first of all, it doesn't feel crowded. It's a large ship by size. It's over a thousand feet. It is one of the large ships out there. And it doesn't feel crowded pretty much anywhere on the ship at any time other than maybe in the grand lobby. And one of the reasons that this can happen is the way the ship was designed because she was built to go transatlantic and cross the ocean numerous, numerous times. She had to be extra reinforced and especially designed to cope with the Atlantic rough weather that you can get in the winter time when you're trying to make those crossings. So if you actually look at the ship, it might look quite large and everything when you look at it from the side, but if you look at it straight on, you will notice that the ship kind of goes inwards for the upper decks. So a lot of the decks that you're on are actually in those lower sections that you would think is kind of like part of the hull. And so anything above that actually kind of seems narrow, not to mention that the hulls are double strength and double thickness of the average cruise ship which causes, you know, structure things to make things narrower. And the ship, the way it was designed, it, uh, it does kind of feel a little dated compared to nowadays cruise ships, that it just seems very, very narrow. For instance, if you take a look at the grand lobby size seen here, it's a, you know, a nice size, big Christmas tree in the, in the area, but you can see there's not a lot of room for an awful lot of activity in the grand lobby. Now, you, you got a room for, uh, you know, what, 10 chairs, and that's about it. Now compare that with the Royal Princess Atrium, and you can see where they actually held an entire dance recital in the middle with all their singers, the four main singers and all their dance troupe. And they can put on huge fun events, horse racing, concerts, line dancing, a lot of things can happen in the piazza that they just don't have room for in the Queen Mary 2. The second thing you should know is that the ship is just steeped with tradition. Everywhere you look, you get pictures of the queen, the monarchy, the royal tradition, you're gonna see all the old Cunard ships with great big large pictures and when you're walking through certain areas of the ship you'll see all the old movie stars uh, Abbott and Costello, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, all the stars that used to come on board on the Queen Mary too and there's huge huge large posters of all those stars lining along the side of the ship Everything about the Queen Mary 2 seems to be designed to teach you about history and tradition of cruising. Unlike some modern cruise lines that are all about the flash and what's new and uh, what we're going to do and look at our high-tech internet. And On the Queen Mary 2, it's all about keeping the old tradition alive when it comes to taking a cruise. They, uh, up on deck, they still have wooden chairs, deck chairs, not the plastic chairs you'll get on some cruise lines. Full-blown wooden chair, deck chairs that you would have had at your cottage had you headed out or along the seaside in the Hamptons in California. You'll also get uh, the tradition of the white glove service and afternoon tea on this ship. So as I said, it's very, very historically accurate as far as old traditional cruising is concerned and that's what they're striving to achieve and they do a really good job of it. While I'm on that section I just want to let you know about the service. I'm not going to count this as one but the service on board whether you're staying in an inside stateroom or you're in one of the Queen's Grill suites 
The service on board is absolutely top notch and very, very professional. They will always strive to make your cruise right. Um, at one point I decided, I just got back to my town, I said, you know what, I'm just going to go up to the buffet and I'm going to grab some bread and some butter and I'm going to work down in my stateroom. I left my stateroom, I walked up to the buffet, two floors, grabbed a plate of some rolls, got some butter, got a drink, walked down to my stateroom and my stateroom attendant had already cleaned and redone my bed. That's how fast they are. And I didn't even, you know, they didn't even, I didn't even see them when I left the room. So that's how on, on the ball they were. Everywhere I went, the service on the ship was top notch. Number three, this kind of surprised me about the ship. The ship is really broken up. It doesn't really seem to have a really good steady flow. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're heading from one end of the ship to the other, you like to be able to go on one deck level and one deck and head to where you're going and get there. When you're on this ship, a lot of times you're finding you're heading down corridors of staterooms to get where you want to go, or you're climbing ramps, or you're coming to a staircase, and if you're in a wheelchair or have mobility issues at all, they have tons of elevators everywhere, lots of personal little elevators to go half levels because there's a staircase going down, uh, but it just, just seems broken up. Um, nothing seems to be all on one level. You'll have a few shops, you'll have the grand lobby, which basically is where you go for your shore excursions and you go to talk to the front desk. When you're heading off to different entertainment areas, sometimes you have to walk down a flight of stairs, up a long ramp, and down another corridor to get to the place where you're going. It, it, everything seems broken up. A lot of people really like that, but I can see it being an issue if you have really bad mobility issues or have to be pushed a lot of ways. I saw this one poor lady pu pushing her husband. She must have been 71. He was about 80, and she had to push him up this ramp to try and get towards the planetarium and it's a pretty steep ramp. I ran over and helped her and I pushed her up and got them in but I can't imagine having to do that every time you go someplace on the ship and that kind of surprised me about the ship. Number four, a great thing, they still have the aft pool and the aft hot tubs. So if you're on that transatlantic cruise and a beautiful sunny summer day Nothing's better than sitting out near the aft pool. You have the white glove service from the bar staff there. Soft music is playing. You're not going to hear club music playing at any of these locations. And it's very tranquil, very peaceful, beautiful wake out the back of the ship. Multi-levels so you can get good views and basically just one of the best ships out there to sit out by a pool, out at the aft, you don't have to pay extra because it's set out in the back. Anybody can go there. And it was one of my favorite places on the ship. Unfortunately, we had huge wind issues and huge storm issues when I went. And we could very rarely ever get out there. But if you're heading out, say, like Caribbean or Bahamas or an air, out through the Med, that would be a prime location for you to spend quite a few days on the Queen Mary 2. Let's talk about the main entertainment on board as far as uh, not the shows. We're talking about what to do during the day, uh, some things to do in the evening, not the main center of entertainment. So what they have on board is, first of all, they have the only planetarium at sea, which is very, very interesting. They have an 8,000 book library. How, how many ships can say they have that many books on board? They hold lectures throughout the day on different topics depending on the itinerary of a ship. So the best way I can say to describe the entertainment is it's very toned down. You're not going to have any big club music or rave music playing and those kind of parties. In fact, the Probably the heaviest music I heard was an 80s night on this ship. Other than that was, it was jazz, it was ballroom dancing, and it was all like Frank Sinatra and those kind of musical tones that you would hear for most of the uh, venues on the ship. You could take in bingo during the day, there's the 
Uh, of course, you can take in the afternoon tea with the white glove ceremonies. You can learn to do fencing. You can take floral arrangement courses. There are all kinds of things to do, but it is very toned down and it is very subdued. So don't expect a lot of yelling and screaming and exciting activities like that. This is all about relaxing and very, very formal entertainment. Number five, speaking of formal, let's talk about the dress code. The average dress code during the day is casual. You can go in shorts, you can be in jeans, you can do whatever you want. But during the evening, that's when things change. For the dining venues and even in the entertainment venues, a non-formal night means you're wearing a suit without a tie. That's, you know, a sport coat you're dressing up, that's their non-formal night, where on some other cruise ships, that would be considered formal dress. So it is, and, and all over the ship, everyone's in formal gowns and tuxedos, and it actually does feel really, really cool to see everybody dressed up like that. And it doesn't matter if you're in, like I said, an inside stateroom, or you're in the most expensive suite, Everybody just blends in. Everybody looks exactly the same. They're all dressed to the nines and everybody seems to have such a good time. And there is something about walking into a main dining room and seeing white glove waiters walking around with uh, silver tea sets and, you know, pheasant under glass is a main dinner course and everybody in tuxes and formal wear and wearing their jewelry. It just it is one of those things that just brings you back to the nostalgia of when cruising used to be an event, not something that you can do you know, twice or three times a year if you really wanted to, but I kind of liked it. And uh, even though I had to buy a couple extra suits because I don't normally go with more than one, I, I went with three on this one. Number seven, now if you're not interested in going into the dining area, for dressing up. You don't have to dress up if you want to go to the buffet. Now on this ship, I was actually a little disappointed with the buffet. Not necessarily the food or the quality of the food, but the choices of food. There were plenty of salads, plenty of fruits, and you know, a fair amount of desserts. Not overly abundant, but a few. But your other choices seem to be almost the same thing every night, with the odd exception of one or two items changing. And it, it just didn't seem to give me the variety that I wanted. It's also a very small buffet area, lots of places to sit. But the buffet itself is kind of small and not that large for the amount of people that are on this ship and can seem sometimes very crowded. On a sea day at lunch, it can seem really, really hard to get in and get your food. Some of the choices were very interesting, like you would have duck, uh, you would have pigeon, you know, there's all kinds of choices that they had, but like I said, the choices were very limited. Uh, normally I have no problem finding things that I want to do and different types of things to try, and pretty much when I went to the buffet, I ended up pretty much always eating the same thing and leaving with the same items with maybe one extra item thrown in. So beware of that. The food is really kind of interesting and they do have, it is good, it is hot. There's nothing wrong with the food, but your selection is going to be limited. Number eight, especially if you're doing a transatlantic cruise, the Cunard still goes with the what I kind of consider outdated internet nowadays, where you get still charged by the minute. And if you're on a transatlantic cruise with this internet system at say one o'clock in the afternoon and you're trying to check your email or open, a, open something on Facebook, it's gonna take a while, even if you can get logged in to begin with. I heard all kinds of complaints from people walking down to the internet cafe to try and get their money refunded because it's not cheap. Uh, I went through $500 in internet while I was on board in my week. Now, keep in mind, I download videos and at one point I downloaded a video that was eight minutes long and normally at home that would take me about four minutes. It took me seven and a half 
hours to download that video on the ship. That should give you a rough idea of how long it can take. Now video is a big process, so take that into consideration, but it is definitely a slow internet on board. For most people, that's not a big issue. They don't want to be hooked up to the world anyway. They want to get away from the world. So, but I thought I should give you a heads up. Number nine, the shows on board. Again, you're going to get a very formal and a very Broadway style shows. You're not going to hear a lot of top 10 music playing on a canard ship. The shows will be based around ballroom dancing, as you may have heard from my interview uh, with one of the dancers on board. They are very traditional. The music itself with their choices, the, you'll get jazz a lot of the times, performers in there. If you get a comedian on board, it's a very PG comedian. You are not ever going to have an adult show on Cunard. It's always going to be very PG. And the comedian we had on board was kind of like Rodney Dangerfield, you know, take my wife, please. That kind of humor, like punchline, 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 <laughs> not really storytelling. Now the theater on board is fair size, but its design is, I like it and I don't like it. The first thing I like is they have tables around all over the place where you can set your drinks down and you can sit back and relax. The seats are really comfortable and it's one of the better theaters for that. It's much more relaxing. You don't feel squished in next to your, the person beside you. However, on the flip side of that, it is an older design. So some of the viewing areas are kind of hidden. At some points you're right behind a pole in your seat. In other points, you have a ceiling that kind of comes down. So you're kind of going between the seats and the ceiling. And so it's like this. And it, if you happen to get a busy show that everyone wants to see and you have to sit in those areas, it's not gonna be a great, great time for yourself. But overall, the shows on board were very fun, very entertaining. Number 10, the dining. Let's talk. First of all, the dining hall, the main dining room is gorgeous. That double layer you can see outside the ship it's very beautiful it's well designed the waiters are very attentive good wine selection everyone is very polite not a lot of crowding around between tables so you're not squeezing past other people to get to your table there's plenty of room and the actual dining hall looks great Every day they change the selection of dinner. The chef prepares a new menu every single day. They post it outside uh, so you can take a quick look at it. Basically you're going to have three entrees, some choice of maybe four to five appetizers and maybe some, about three or four desserts that you can choose. About 10 to 12 items depending on the day. And the food is okay. It wasn't spectacular, but it is a main dining room. It was hot when it got to me. It was flavorful. There's nothing I ate that I said, oh, that's not very good. People beside me loved the food. Another person beside me was kind of disappointed with the food. She said she didn't like anything on the menu. And I'm going, well, you, know, you have a pretty wide choice, actually. Uh, and you could also order off the menu. You could order a steak or a fish um, entree off the menu if nothing on the menu strikes your fancy. So there are a selection. Just be prepared. It's not going to be a wide, wide choice that you might see on some other bigger cruise lines. You can have a set menu and it changes every single night. So there you go. There's 10 things that I thought you should know about the Queen Mary 2, especially if you're doing that transatlantic crossing. The ship is large, but once you get inside, it might not seem as large as it looks because of the narrow build, uh, especially when you're talking about the grand lobby and the atrium where a lot of people are used to having that big open space that's a kind of a gathering spot for everybody, right? Well, in this one, uh, the gathering spot's more in one section of the ship in a big open ballroom, so, Slow internet, good food, very formal, very traditional, very beautiful ship. 
I thoroughly enjoyed my time on the Queen Mary too, and I learned a lot during those seminars that they had on, on board as well. That was great. I loved those, and I look forward to maybe taking an Alaskan cruise with Cunard and learning all about Alaska that way as well. So that's a little bit. I hope you like this video. I hope you might give the Queen Mary a try and do one of those transatlantic crossings. Everyone should try it at least once. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more tips, more tricks, more travel vlogs from around the world, please hit that subscribe button. Till next time, have yourself a safe and a great vacation.